Hello and welcome to another edition of In Conversation. I'm Tim Eckert. My guest today is the author and adventurer Tim Cope. An Australian by birth, he decided to train as a wilderness guide in Finland. That led to an adventure riding across Russia to China by bicycle, and then to a bolder journey on horseback across Mongolia, all the way east to Kazakhstan and Ukraine, eventually ending up in Hungary. The journey took three years, and his story is told in On the Trail of Genghis Khan, published by Bloomsbury. I wondered what put the idea of braving desert heat waves, winter blizzards, wolves, and bandits into his head. The f- the first time that my, I told my mother about this, she had a similar response. The main reason that she she couldn't fathom this at this point was that I couldn't ride a horse, and this was to be, as you mentioned, a six thousand mile journey from the old capital of the Mongol Empire, Harahorn, right across the Eurasian Steppe to the Danube River in Hungary. You are Australian. Australia, of course, is another big country where you can have adventures. What put the idea in your head of, of travelling from the southern hemisphere all the way to the east? When I was twenty years old, I actually studied in Finland as a wilderness guide, and that was kind of just a, a fluke, really, that I managed to to discover this course. I got a scholarship. I left my law degree behind quite happily in Australia, and I've always been fascinated by by places that I don't know much about. And certainly for me, Russia was this huge blank on the map. Growing up in school, I didn't learn much about it. And of course, after the collapse of the Soviet Union that I'd lived through when I was at school in 1989, 1990, it, it really fascinated me, this world that we didn't know anything about. And particularly, I didn't know anything about how the ordinary people live in these hundreds of thousands of villages that are scattered across this, this vast place that stretches from, from, uh, from Finland all the way to the Pacific, of course. In the east. So it was the differentness, and it was the, the complete contrast to the world that you knew. And, and a place that, that, that I almost felt as if uh, it was a mythical place where, we, unlike Europe or America, we didn't know much about it. We only heard, got these fleeting glimpses in, in the media. Uh, I studied with Russians in Finland as a wilderness guide. Uh, there were some people from Karelia, from Petrozovodsk, and there was a, 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 my neighbour in the dormitory where I live called Dimitri, and he began to teach me Russian, and I taught him English. And actually, we spent three months studying in Petrozovodsk in Karelia, which is just north of uh, St. Petersburg region. Finland at that time, for me as a 19, 20-year-old, was a very measured place, a very to the point of almost sterility for me. And Russia was this place that, that was, was abounding with contradictions, a mix of different cultures, uh, and I wanted to travel there. And so I set off when I was uh, a year later, when I'd just turned 20, almost 21, to ride a bicycle from Petrozovodsk uh, across northwest Russia, Siberia, to Beijing. And it was 12 months of cycling in 1999, 2000, and discovering Russia for myself. And I so that obviously gave you, uh, you had the, the, the love, you had the interest, you had the familiarity, and now you had the language. You'd done the bicycle thing, but horses are very difficult, d- different things to bicycles, aren't they? I mean, they're a living creature. You said you're not that experienced a rider at the beginning of all this, but you were attracted by the freedom that the horses would give you. And of course, the cultures of many of the peoples that you met in that region relied very much on horses. And I think you, you state clearly in the book that mm. part of the, the journey was discovering the area of the world where mankind probably first domesticated the horse. The horse was dom- domesticated on where that was, I think, is now the northern part of uh, Kazakhstan, the Botai people, about 5,500 years ago. They began to ride horses, uh, domesticate them for milking, for meat. And uh, ever since that time, these nomadic people have been migrating from east to west, from East Asia to the Danube, uh, and there's been all kinds of uh, rise and falls of empires, the Mongols being just one, uh, although the greatest and the largest. And, uh, yeah, the idea was that I could just put a compass in my hand, I could sit, sit on this horse, I was free of roads, free of the modern world, after all, this is a land, even today, from Mongolia to Hungary, without fences predominantly, and I could just ride as far as I wanted. In fact, one friend of mine said, just keep riding following the setting sun, and when the people start speaking French, uh, you know you've gone too far. <laughs> However, 
Five days into the trip, uh, I woke up at two o'clock in the morning. I heard this sniggering and then the sound of horses galloping into the night. I leapt out. Two of my three horses had been stolen. Mm. So I set off on my third horse and about two hours right away came across this herd and there were my horses. Uh, the herder came up and said, oh, you must have tied them really badly. They came to me themselves. He took me back to his home, which was a nomad tent. He, he, we feasted on fermented mare's milk meat and he taught me this very interesting Mongolian proverb which is that a man on the step without friends is as narrow as a finger and a man on the step with friends is as wide as the step and to me that was the first big lesson that on a horse I, I not only had of course I had the freedom but I also was participating in their culture and I would have to learn very quickly the laws of their land and of course the outlook of the nomad. And I learnt over time that if someone's trying to steal your horse on the step, it should be taken as a compliment because it means that you've got a horse that's worth treasuring. The constant challenge of every day was finding grass, finding water, protecting the horses. And to do that involved getting knowledge from local people. And so I lost my independence as a traveller like I had on a bicycle where I could go wherever I wanted. And I became more a part of the fabric of the society. But always tied to the needs of my animals and so uh, there's a different kind of uh, freedom uh, but with also its limitations. Obviously you respected the culture, you were very uh, grateful for the friendship and the assistance you had in an environment that was not your own native environment but what was your perception of how aware those people were in Mongolia of the outside world and the modern world? Was it something that they saw as a threat or was it still something that was just too far from their daily lives that it didn't really matter? Uh, in in the remote areas of Kazakhstan and Mongolia, there's two sides to the story. On on one hand, uh, all nomads have been educated. So in the in the Soviet times, they set up schools where they have actually, a, if you like, a dormitory where children stay during the winter months. They go to school in the summer. They rejoin their families for the migration period. So they actually know more about our own countries, about England, about Europe, about Australia, about America, certainly much more than we know about them. On the other hand, what I really liked about about Mongolia is that nomadic culture pervades every corner of the site, whether it's urban people in the city or people in the remote countryside. Uh, we often think in the Western world of nomads as somehow being a marginalised society, perhaps living on the fringes, perhaps even disadvantaged or non-conforming. Uh, but we forget that that's a product generally of colonisation of areas where we've basically pushed away nomadic people's lands. And and uh, in Mongolia, it's such a dominant culture still that, that, that everything revolves around it. There's a great pride in their culture. To be held in the countryside in high status still involves being a proud herder with fine horses, having the skills to... To, to look after sheep and goats and camels and, and yaks. So they're, I mean, they're, they're still seasons. proud so of their own culture. They're, absolutely they're, they're not, not envious of <clears throat> concrete buildings and TVs and um, Western clothing. No, no, if you go into there, and that's what I think the real value in Mongolia is. It's a place where that pride still is extremely strong. And, and I think an indi- one indicator of that, actually, <laughs> is that when, when things were stolen from me on a long route, it was usually a halter for my horse, a rope, a hobble, uh, they were never interested in my video camera, my money, things like that. As I shifted f- west westwards into Europe, places such as Ukraine and Hungary, where the horse no longer played such a central role in life, then I could have left my saddle in the street all day and probably no one would have stolen it, but I had to sleep with it in my tent <laughs> in Mongolia and, uh, and Kazakhstan. So I think that's an indicator of, of how an important role. And I think that's also something that should be treasured and uh, interestingly I guess what I realised after three and a half years of writing to Hungary I'd come to appreciate what a treasure these societies are only to return in 2008 after the trip to realise that Mongolia in that time had begun to change. Big mining has since uh, arrived in in Mongolia and whilst that has uh, given great benefit and huge economic growth, Mongolia was actually the fastest growing economy in the world in 2011. Uh, It's also troubling for a society where the uh, economy and culture 
you know, is a very ancient one, and society lives by a very different tempo, one of the nomadic migrations. And there is a risk, of course, that big industry can uh, marginalise not only the economy uh, of the herding people, but their culture, and it shifts the aspirations and values of the younger generations, uh, who therefore see mining as a quick route to, to wealth. And uh, I think that's the danger. At the moment, uh, the Mongolian government and and uh, Rio Tinto, who's the major investor in the largest copper mine, Oyotogwe, they've reached a stalemate and it's actually kind of stopped production for the time being. And I think that's, at the moment, it's a very important opportunity for for Mongolian society to, to, to stop and reflect on what's at stake uh, if this isn't managed in the right way. What about your own internal culture, if you like? Uh, you were with the horses. I've known other adventurers, other travellers, again, with not much of a horsey background, uh, regard the horse much as you probably regarded your bicycle as the thing they had to get to be friends with in order to accomplish the journey. But other people, of course, form a very deep emotional attachment to their horse and to horses forever more. What was your experience? Are you now a lover of horses or was that just something you needed at the time? Uh, my horses became my connection to the land, really, and connection to the culture. They would hear things, see things long before I had and they became this this wonderful way of viewing and experiencing the landscape. I can recount every blade of grass pretty much <laughs> from Mongolia to to Hungary. And I realise, of course, that, that there was a reflection of this great symbiosis of man and animal working together in this step, which, of course, is what people have been doing, whether it be the Tatars of Crimea, the Kalmyks uh, uh, near the Caspian Sea, the Kazakhs, the, even the Magyars in Hungary. They've been doing this for thousands of years. And... And uh, each individual horse uh, took on such a wonderful character for me. They almost became like like human beings, and I couldn't bear the thought of letting them go. So I actually spent six weeks on each border, uh, stuck trying to get permits to, to reach the next country. And paradise on this trip was really falling asleep at night, listening to them munch on grass, knowing that I'd done my job for the day. And a bad night was... A sleepless hours on end, lying there in, in pure silence, knowing that there was not a single blade of grass for them to eat and I'd failed them. The horses uh, became such an important part of my life that when it came to the end and I went back to Australia, I really felt as if uh, I'd, I'd, uh, a part of my body had been cut away. Uh, it's a, and in fact, I've just come back from Hungary, uh, where I went and revisited my horses, uh, Ogunyok and Taskany and, and Kok. Who looks after them? I gave them away to an orphanage at their very end in Hungary and they've since set up a riding program mostly for gypsy orphan children and people who have been uh, have gone into state welfare and uh, these horses have, have, have um, they've been treasured by this organisation and they're looking very plump and, and, and uh, full of energy and I never thought I'd have the opportunity and the privilege to spend some time with them again but I spent three Did days. they recognise you? Well, horses don't show that kind of outward affection, particularly not step horses, but I think they did. I certainly remembered their smells and I got on their backs and rode as if no, not a moment had, had passed and uh, it was a moment that I'll, I'll treasure and hopefully I'll be able to come back next year and spend some time with them again. And uh, I think horses will be a part of my life forever. What about what happened to you on the journey? You've written about wolves, you've written about all the marvellous people you met, um, uh, even the thieves, but a, a, a lot of people very hospitable to you and, of course, passed on vital knowledge that was crucial to your survival. But what did the journey do to your head? Uh, I guess there were, in, in one sense, there were these uh, two broad experiences going on uh, personally. One was this experience of, of, of open spaces, of being able to sit on this horse, feel the wind in my hair, uh, look around and see this pancake flat land or some hills maybe in the distance and just have that ultimate freedom, a land with no boundaries, being able to, to travel wherever I wanted, watching my dog Tigan, who was given to me by an old Kazakh herder called Asset, watching him kind of gallop along on the horizon. It, it infused a sense of freedom that I think... A lot of us have in deep inside of us as children, we, we, and it's hard to explain what that, what 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 that what that 
infused in me and often I think back and think it was the perhaps one of the most precious times I've ever had. Uh, on the other hand, my experience was one of, of very much people. So I'd arrive in, either in a nomadic community or a settled village and uh, the people would come out. In Kazakhstan, for example, it was crucial to find a place. I was riding through the night to escape the 50 degrees of heat and I had to find somewhere to take shelter before this great big ball of fire came rising back in, over the horizon. And uh, they have they're actually what they call the 40 days in a row of about 40 degrees. And these people would take me in all kinds of states of disrepair uh, in these underground huts in that case and they would treat me like some kind of long lost son and they say in Kazakh that the first time as a friend as a guest you're a friend second time as a guest you're part of the family and third time you can stay for life and I remember turning up absolutely exhausted they'd take the horses away to somewhere to graze they'd help me with my gear they'd put down a mattress bring me some tea and some fermented camel's milk and let me sleep there was no obligation, and yet in those moments, they not only treated me like part of the family, but there was a sense of camaraderie and friendship that developed that I think is enough to last a lifetime. And it made me very aware that uh, you can be very too, you can be very quick to judge people, particularly in our society where we're a lot more independent and isolated. Uh, on my journey, I just had to appeal to the better side of human beings, no matter who they were. If I needed help and I was in trouble. Whoever was there was there. It was the people who I had to to go to, and it's it's changed me a lot. In that, uh, I try to make friends with all walks of life and not make a judgment. But ev- everyone's got something very interesting to offer, an interesting story to tell that can broaden your horizon. Uh, the journey also became a very personal one in other ways. Um, three quarters of the way through the trip in Ukraine, when I thought I'd been through all the hardship, uh, there was a a beeping that came to my satellite phone. I stopped, got off, uh, checked the message I called home to discover that my father, uh, Andrew, had unfortunately been killed in a car accident that day back in Australia. So uh, the journey came to a complete standstill at that point. You write write about that incident, a life-changing incident for you, the loss of your father. You also write about this, this sense of panic that you were so far away at the moment of his death and not and wanting desperately to to know when the exact moment was that he departed and trying to retrace your footsteps to a to a point yeah. in the journey when your father would have been still alive. alive can you explain that sense that came over you of wanting to reconnect with him after i found out the news it was almost as if there were these uh, two parts of me that separated there was the the part of me that had to look after the daily realities, it was evening, it was cold, I had to find a camp, I had to stake the horses out. And that kind, that part of me did everything in pilot automatic pilot mode, but this other, other part of me was just in pure panic and, and trauma, and all I could think was that I had to get back as fast as I could to a place where I'd been where he was alive, where I'd been his son, to the world where... Uh, where where his spirit might still be before it kind of left. And uh, I felt that to go forward without him uh, would be to abandon him somehow or to to forge into places that I wasn't ready, that I simply wasn't ready for. And so I, I galloped back and I felt as if the faster I could get back, I could almost go back in time to the point where he was still alive, I guess. And uh, Do you think that reaction... Can you look back on it now rationally and say it was grief that drove that or do you think it was this connection you had with nature and the universe in a way in that vast landscape that may have made you more spiritually aware? I think the the journey prepared me in many in, in many ways uh, for this uh, serendipitously you know in a way I hadn't really obviously foreseen. The nomads always ask the first question in fact when they greet you is do you have parents? And I always found that a really odd greeting. Uh, but of course now I understood that, that uh, it's a reflection really that of on the step how crucial family is considered to be in your life. Uh, they say that, that um, mountains never meet but people do. And I think that, that says a lot about the, the preciousness of our, that we have as human beings of our capacity to make human relationships and it's not something that we should take for granted ever 
certainly they talk about in the step that chronology doesn't really matter. And I felt as if chronology was all being tipped upside down often during my journey. And this was one moment where it felt as if uh, everything was turned on its head. Uh, on one hand, it felt as if, um, what does it matter if he was destined to die now? Then perhaps perhaps he was always going to die. And this is, the death is essentially a part of life. On the other hand, um, was it meant to be? It, it was a very difficult thing to, to, to kind of think about. But certainly I got home. I spent four and a half months uh, with, my, with my... I'm the oldest of four kids. I had two brothers and a sister. And eventually uh, I had to make a decision whether to, to stay with my family in Australia as the oldest child or return to my family in Ukraine, my three horses and dog Tiggin. Eventually I, I did return... And arriving back and collecting the horses, I took them back to the footprint of my tent uh, from the previous uh, winter. I knew that that's where I'd spent my last night where Dad was alive. And I felt very strongly that, that, that moving on from this point in time was going into new places without him. And uh, that was a big step to make. And it felt as if for the first time I was truly going alone. And ironically, that last 1,500 kilometres was probably the the easiest of the whole journey. Uh, there was no longer the threat of these really harsh conditions of, of running out of water and food, that kind of thing. But life felt very fragile. <laughs> when I arrived in Opustasur, my mother Anne uh, came and my brother John arrived. And I w- was looking forward more than anything else, I think, to getting home to Australia. I think... A lot of people begin travelling, as I did, as a way of bucking a family life, of of finding yourself, self-discovery, of independence, of going out and seeing the world. And I certainly didn't miss my family when I was 18, 19, but on this journey I really did. Uh, It pushed me to limits that I'd never experienced. Uh, when, When I was in the desert in Kazakhstan, I remember feeling so very isolated and it was so, so hard. Uh, that I used to put sunscreen on myself sometimes because I liked the smell. It reminded me of family holidays at the beach. And I missed family uh, to a point that uh, I had to really contain my panic at times. When you resumed that journey, you say from the footprint of your tent, uh, from the, the moment when you heard about your father, you went back to the journey, obviously still grieving for him. Did, did it make you talk to him as you rode along? Yeah, I, I had a very un canny experience where whereby as I was riding along it, 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 it was almost very palpable that, that he appeared <laughs> walking alongside me and uh, he was wearing shorts and this little day pack that he always wore when I was a kid and he'd take us into the bush and uh, there was a look of wonder in his face. He'd retired one year before uh, he died and he'd spent that year reading, exploring, finding out about places that he never had an opportunity to in his working life. Uh, it was very upsetting to think that, that the plan that we had had at one stage for him to come and join me on the trip hadn't happened. And I really, really uh, felt disappointed in myself that I hadn't pushed him harder to and to make it happen and for him to come along. Are you saying you felt a sense that he was there or... you? To, no, to I, you, he I, was I, there. I, to me, and I felt a sense that he was there and uh, that he knew where I was and he was working along. He even bent down and kind of picked up a plant, I think, and said uh, something along the lines of, uh, you know, isn't life amazing? Which, I mean, that's what he used to tell me when I was a kid. <laughs> and then we reached the end of this stretch of forest where, where he basically said goodbye and um, he went bounding off to, towards this village in the distance, actually, and there was this, 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 this look of wonder and, and, and enjoyment in his eyes as if he was now going out to experience places that in life he'd never had a chance to see. And, and then I was just back in crying and, uh, and, and in hysterics, really. And then there were other points where he seemed to come back, and I think that was why I was going back. I wanted to somehow get close to him. And uh, I was even paranoid that if I went further... He might not know where I was because it was a place I'd never been when he was alive. Yeah. What about adjusting to life after these three years on horseback across these 
uh, very different cultures and landscapes. Um, how difficult was it for you to readjust to life back in the modern Western world? When I arrived back in Australia, it felt as if I'd left my whole family behind for starters. So I felt very, very lost and uh, dispossessed in a way. Um, I walked along that same road where I'd walked with my mother and told her about this trip and looked across to the hills and suddenly felt very claustrophobic to see all these fences that were separating me from the hills in the distance. And that wasn't something I'd ever been able to see before, that this land was kind of in shackles. Uh, and it was a very, very intense feeling almost of claustrophobia. Eventually I realised, of course, that adjusting to life back home was much more difficult than adjusting to life initially on the step. And uh, at the time I'd finished the trip, I knew there was no chance ever in getting my horses home, so I donated them to an orphanage. But I did hold out hopes to bring my dog home, Tigan. Now, Tigan had been given to me as this little pup when he was six months old by a, by a man called Asset, who had actually said, you need a friend on this long road, uh, someone to protect you from the wolves and someone to keep you warm at night in the tent. And he gave me this scrawny little pup who I thought at the time wouldn't last more than a couple of weeks. But he'd grown into this uh, adult dog, had these parallel rites of passage. He'd become a father. He'd, uh, he'd been hit, he'd been stolen, he'd been lost, frozen. Uh, but it was going to cost $10,000 to get him home and he would have to become an EU citizen uh, uh, before he could even get a permit to come to Australia. So I left him behind. I'd get these messages uh, to, from time to time from the farmer who was, who was looking after him to say that he'd chased a horseman for half a day and taken all the dogs with him. There was one stage when he had to send a taxi to pick all the dogs up and bring them back. But eventually I did get a letter in the mail from uh, Aquis Australian Quarantine, to say that I could get him back and... I got him in a taxi from uh, Budapest to Vienna and then he arrived by plane in Melbourne and reuniting with him, having him in Australia, was one small step on that road to resolving that huge cultural and physical gap between what I'd experienced and had become my life and Australia. And of course the beyond that I spent two years making a film, four and a half years writing the book. I talked to lots of groups, whether it be schools, whether it be organisations, uh, and that's been a very cathartic process of, for me of, of figuring out these different things I learned that can be applied to our life. And Will there be another and, journey? Uh, Do you feel the urge, with horses or uh, without, to go at, on another long solo journey? At the moment I feel very uh, harmonious and very settled, but I'd love to travel from India to Europe on the trail of the Roma people, the gypsies at Tsigane. I'd love to travel from northwest China across Tibet into India. I'd like to return to Kazakhstan and Russia and Mongolia. Uh, there's Life's too short to fit everything in. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the next one will be, but it will probably involve animals and no doubt somewhere back on the Eurasian continent. It's become such a part of me and, and, uh, and it feels like my second home. That was the author Tim Cope talking to me about his new book, On the Trail of Genghis Khan, An Epic Journey Through the Land of the Nomads. I'm Tim Eckert, and you've been listening to In Conversation. Conversation.